morning. Is everybody ready to learn about dinosaurs? I'm ready. So I know that a whole bunch of guests are here for Dinosaur Week and we are excited. We want to welcome you to the Institute for Creation Research. This is our Discovery Center and this, because I've already said it twice and you know why you're here, is Dinosaur Week. And we have some fun, fun stuff planned. We have workshops, we have we don't do lectures here, we do dynamic presentations. And they will be dynamic, they will be engaging, they will be fun. But anything worth doing is worth doing right. So we're going to start it off right. Can we open up in prayer? Would you guys bow your heads with me? And, and come on in, you can walk in, we are family. You can come to the table during prayer and nobody's going to be mad. And, and we're going to have people that continue to come in as the planetarium show ends. People are going to, we're, we're making announcements right now that this presentation is beginning. We have guests coming from the exhibit hall. So be gracious with us. If you have some nice people, oh, excuse me, oh, pardon me, excuse me, you know, come stepping into their seats but for now let's pray father you taught us to come into your presence with praise and with thanksgiving and lord we give you praise we give you honor we give you glory you are worthy of it all and we are so thankful for ICR, Lord, for, for our speakers, the Lomans, for, for these wonderful ministries, the exhibitors that we have out in the atrium, for bringing us, giving us spring break so that we can come here in your presence to learn about you, Lord. I pray that every single one of us, when we leave the Discovery Center today, that our capacity for faith and for trusting you and your word would just grow exponentially. Would you broaden that capacity in us? Lord, help our brains retain some of this knowledge that you're going to impart to us today. And Lord, let it be a fun experience. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. So, we are here, to, yes, to learn about dinosaurs, but here at the Institute for Creation Research, we have an interesting approach to science. We're not here to prove the Bible's uh, 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 legitimacy. No, that, that's not our responsibility at all. What we do is we take scripture, we take what the Bible says, and we start there. It's, well, it said behemoth right here. There, in Leviathan, we got to look into these things. We got to learn about these creatures that are in the Bible. So we, we, that's where we start here at ICR. That's why we're here. We're here to learn more about what the Bible says about who we are. We get to learn more about our creator and whose image we are created. I hope whenever we get to go home today, we take a look in the mirror and we're like, okay, he's a pretty good creator. Yes, hmm. I hope. That's, that's what I hope for me. Anyways, so uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna get to hear from our first speaker this morning, but at 1 p.m. today, we want you guys back in here to hear from ICR's research scientist, our paleobiochemist, Dr. Brian Thomas. He is our dinosaur expert. He gives dynamic presentations just like our first presenter does. But up, up, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna kick it off strong. We have a good strong start. This morning, we, I get to introduce Mr. Tommy Lohan. Tommy Lohman, excuse me, is the Vice President of the Creation Apologetics Ministry Foundation Advancing Creation Truth. He also serves as the field paleontologist for the Glendive Dinosaur and Fossil Museum in Glendive, Arizona. I see our guests. Will you please help me welcome very warmly Mr. Tommy Lohman. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Let me get this thing cranked up here. And we are up and running. Who loves dinosaurs? I love dinosaurs. This is my very first ever dinosaur week here. And I'm excited about getting to be part of this, but I'm also excited to get to share my passion, my interest in dinosaurs. What we're gonna be doing today is we're gonna be looking at the excavation of a dinosaur. I got to lead uh, the team of this past summer up in Glendive, Montana. But I want to kind of begin to set a little foundation, a little framework for us as we begin to work through things here this morning. Let me see if we're moving. Ah, here we go. 
And so what I've titled my talk is Raising Ruth, and I'll explain who Ruth is in just a minute. But it's important for us to kind of understand how God has wonderfully created these animals, how God has uh, brought about a flood of judgment that we can begin to understand what's going on in the world that we see. And as James was saying, set us for a solid biblical worldview. This is the museum that uh, I serve at in, uh, during the summers up in Glendive. It's actually Montana, not Arizona. So if you go west, you're going to miss us, okay? Uh, but this is our museum here. This is the main exhibit hall, and we have casts and stuff here. We enjoy these kinds of relationships we have with ICR. Uh, they're coming up uh, late, uh, early August to do a dinosaur dig with us. And so if you're interested in doing that, I would encourage you to look up on their website and chase down that information. Now, when I think about a paleontologist and what a paleontologist does, there are many hats that we wear in the process. First of all, we got to be part biologist, which means that we have a pile of bones that we've never seen alive. We've never seen it standing up and walking around. And so there's an importance for us to be able to understand how do modern animals function? How do they move? And in doing so, we can make relevant application to the dinosaurs themselves. And that is an important starting point for us. From there, we had to be part geneticist. Not that we're looking to get into the, to that deeply, but from my worldview, from my understanding, I recognize that dinosaurs are designed. They're complex. And we go all the way right down to the genetic code and where that genetic information exists. That is the blueprint upon which these animals are created and how they grow into what we see, at least the skeletons of today. We also had to be part geologist as we begin to recognize the lay of the ground. We recognize that the layers of the ground are stratified. I'll get into this in a little bit later with some more pictures. But it's important to recognize that the world speaks and screams global deluge. We see evidence of water everywhere. And when we dig, we're recognizing the layers which only occurs by water depositing sediment. And so that's an important recognition for us. We also have to be part engineers. And if you are gonna be here by chance tomorrow, I'm gonna to be doing a talk on behemoth. And I'm gonna be making the case that behemoth is a sauropod. And when we begin to look at the complex systems of our world, particularly in the world of buildings and how machinery moves, and how we put those structures together, we can now in turn recognize engineering principles within the dinosaurs themselves and how they function. This should remind us once again that God has created these animals complex. And we see that the information precedes the organism's existence. Finally, we had to be part historian and theologian. And this is really so critically important when you see certain things from, if you will, a secular worldview, they create their own history. What we do and what I what's so important for me is that I build my history upon a biblical worldview. In the beginning, God created. We see the Genesis flood. These aren't mythological stories, but these are literal events that happened in the past of the world. And I can in turn build upon these events as I go out into the field and interpret what I see. So just a basic, I'm going to guess we're probably all really clear on this, but where did dinosaurs come from? God created them. Nothing has ever existed that God did not bring into existence first. And so to walk that if you will, that world view through and the logical conclusion, again, building our foundation upon a biblical basis, have dinosaurs always existed? They have not. And so we know that they came to exist. So in doing that, we recognize that dinosaurs are land animals. They're not the flyers. They're not the swimmers. They're land animals. And therefore, land created on the sixth day of the creation week. And we can see that clearly in Scripture. And so we see that in Genesis 1, 
25 is that God said, let there bring forth living creatures after their kind. And that serves for us an anchor point, a foundation upon which we can build our thinking. So when were dinosaurs created? If dinosaurs were land animals, land animals are created on the sixth day of creation, then it logically flows that dinosaurs would have been created on the sixth day of the creation week. And what day was man created on? The sixth day of creation. Therefore, were man and dinosaurs alive at the same time? And we recognize they certainly were. Continue this, and this begins to kind of press us towards Ruth and what's going on with Ruth as we look at the excavation in just a minute. As we're reminded that God judged the world through a global flood. Genesis 6 affirms this as we see the end of all flesh has come before me for the earth is filled with violence because of them. It's one of the things that resonates with me repeatedly. Because from a secular perspective, what I wind up getting into is it's easy to see people thinking that dinosaurs are a testimony towards deep time and long ages. And they're really not. Because what dinosaurs really are is more of a mirror. When I look at a dinosaur fossil, I'm reminded that God, in fact, does judge sin. Because the Bible is telling us that in the flood occurred as a result of man's sin is an important foundation for us to build upon. Am I going in and out or is it just in my head? Okay. <laughs> Now, when we look at Genesis chapter 7, we see a narrative here that repeatedly describes the geological processes that are going on here. Do you need me to switch? Yeah, I'm going to give you mine. Okay. Thank you guys for being gracious with us. Now, we have an intermission, but y'all, if y'all need to stand up and do jumping jacks or something, you can't. Thank you, Tommy. All right. There we go. So as we're looking here in Genesis chapter 7, and you're looking, I've highlighted these passages right here. Is there any question as to what's actually going on, is there? The fountains of the great deep split open. The floodgates of the sky were opened. The rains came upon the earth. The flood came upon the earth. Water multiplied. Water prevailed. Water prevailed. All the high mountains were covered. Water prevailed. Mountains were covered, water prevailed, and water prevailed. What's being described here? We're seeing the flood and the impact of the flood. And it literally changed the shape of the face of the earth. And it's why we have a fossil record across the globe. It's because of this one event here. Where we are at is in the Hell Creek Formation up in uh, eastern Montana. is where our particular area is. I've got this geological map here, and you see the black line. <clears throat> Basically, that sits on the eastern edge at the foot of the Rocky Mountains. And you see the red, that's the higher peaks, and it progresses down to the orange, and the yellows and the greens, and you get blues to the lowest. Now, I insert this side map here, and this is just a map here just to give you a general sense of dinosaur fossil sites, or just fossil sites in general. And you'll see them really highlighted or concentrated in two particular areas, to the east of the mountains. And that circle is more of a high plains area. We get asked from time to time, why are the fossils here in Montana? Well, it's not so much that they lived here, and it's not even exclusively per se that they died here, but they're actually more exposed here. And so what we're seeing is as the floodwaters run off, the mountains, the Rocky Mountains in particular, would have lifted up, and we're having erosion flowing to the south and to the east. And so we're digging up fossils as a result of the erosional features. We're finding them in these locations. And so our particular location here is in, as I mentioned, Glendive, Montana, eastern Montana. You see the red dot there. And the green band that's particularly going uh, southeast out of Glendive is part of the Hell Creek Formation. This is Ruth. She's not much to look at right now. But I can tell you, she was amazing to see in the ground. 
and you get just a general glimpse of what she looked like here. And what I want to take you through is the journey, the process of our, us actually excavating the fossils and what that was like, what, uh, what procedures and techniques might be involved with this process. This is what Ruth would have looked like alive at Mountosaurus annectans, roughly 30 feet long, probably five to six tons. Uh, the, our dinosaur looks to be fairly full grown as best we can tell. You get a general sense of within the hadrosaurs or the duckbill dinosaurs, you might be familiar with these other creatures here. They're all in that same created kind. Now, as we move into our particular area in Glendive, Montana, and this is right close to our excavation site here, had a friend do a drone flyby. And I thought it'd be nice to kind of give you a general sense of the terrain that we dig in. This here, you see this tarp right here? There's a part of a triceratops under the ground there. Uh, and so we have not been part of that particular dig. We were down below. Uh, but it's fascinating just to see. And you think about, we're actually going to be digging down here for, for Ruth, and yet you've got something way up here. And you're probably 125, 150 feet. So you've got a general sense of the depth of the fossil record in this particular area. Now this is a flyby into our dig site right here. Now this is where I want to kind of highlight a few things. If you notice the mountain range at the top, uh, those are probably again 100, and I say mountains, they're not like mountain mountains. In Texas they may look like mountains. <laughs> but they're probably again in that 150 to 200 foot height, but they're highly stratified. You see the layers, you're going to have sandstone, uh, claystone, you're going to have some volcanic material mixed in. And this, this highly stratified layering is a result of the water. What we're digging in is the floodplain. And so all of this would have been deposited originally, and you have these higher layers. But as the waters begin to change their energy, they would have created this canyon they're working right through here. And so this floodplain is actually more of a canyon that sits between two uh, mountain ranges on either side. Uh, I'm thinking, and we've got on the back side here, there's been some more bones washing out here. I don't know if it's just me excited about wanting to have more skeletons, but we're convinced that this is all full of dinosaur skeletons. We don't know that yet, but we're hoping, and that's what we're looking for. As we look at the ground itself, let me get jumped ahead here. This is the nature of what the ground looks like right underneath roof. Now, if you'll notice, there's a lot of really finely sorted, almost sand-like material. Then you have small pebbles of clay mixed in. This reminds us and should point out that water has been moving through here quite a bit, and which really causes me to really wonder, how does Ruth even stay together? Because I don't think Ruth the location we found her, that's not the location she died, and that's probably not even the location she originally was buried in. We think she was moved to this location, and that's as a result of, you see, of the sorting of the material here. And so as I begin to think through what might hold Ruth together, now when I say soft tissue, I'm not talking about the internal structures with blood vessels and things of that nature, which Dr. Thomas works on, but I'm talking about more tendons and muscles and ligaments and even skin. Could that have all been present for a period of time until she found her final resting place here and then that material decayed away? And so we're just pondering that idea as well. In fact, Dr. Thomas has a piece of Ruth here, and I know you've been doing some studies on that as well. As we begin to get into the process of excavating, the first thing we want to do is create a grid. This gives us a sense of the lay of the skeleton, gives us an idea of what bones went to what, the position of which one, because as we start getting things out of the ground and taking it back to the museum, we need some log, some way to track what went where, what goes to what, and then we're still reassembling the puzzle even beyond that because not everything is in particular life position. And so you see the work here that's going on. We create 
uh, the squares, they're one meter square, 39 inch square grid. And we're marking that out, just tracking what's what. And this is the grid uh, that my wife, she's good with this kind of stuff, so she took care of that and put our orientation. If you'll notice here, this is the tail section right here. You've got the processes, spinous processes here. These are chevrons down below. Legs down here, legs up here. You see the ribs up here. And so you can kind of begin to get a sense of how things are oriented, what things are in right position, and what things are going to have to be adjusted. Now visually, I want to give you just a second to kind of soak this in. Because most of what you see is dirt. But do you see all the shapes? You see the long linear patterns. Those are bones. Do you see anything that repeats itself? You see the bottom left-hand corner? That's the tail section. And so what you're trying to do in this process of being out digging is to really begin to get your brain and your mind situated so you can begin to understand and recognize things more quickly. This is our first day of digging here, and we're beginning to orient things. Now, I had in my mind the order of how things were going to come out of the ground. But yet, as we get into it, you find that because they're so jumbled together here, that didn't always work out, where you got this is under that, and you got to do this first. And so it was really a sorting out, an unpuzzling of the puzzle. So let's start with the tibia and the fibula. Those are the lower leg bones. This is, this is two of them right here. We actually had both legs complete. And we start the process of excavating the dirt around. We're trying to go down. This is a fairly long bone, as you can see by Jason right there. That bone's probably close to three feet long. Now, what he's doing here is he's beginning also to tunnel underneath. If you'll notice here, these openings. And as he worked through those openings, he began to create an, a means by which we can start wrapping foil and start putting a field jacket on it. We start with foil because that begins to give it the first level of stability and strength. It also protects the bone from the plaster burlap bag uh, jacket that we're going to wrap around that as well. And so they begin to kind of work this out. This is their first strip they're putting on. We're just cutting burlap bags. There's nothing fancy here. Really, there isn't, but it's, but it's very effective. This is, these are procedures and techniques that have been in practice for well over 100 years. As they work through, they start on the end. You see Joshua starts wrapping the one end of the bone and starts to lay the material across. We're patting it into the surface of the bone. We want the jacket to be the contour because what we're assuming and what we know is that these bones are broken, fractured, and so we need to be able to get them out of the ground in as good a shape as possible. They're continuing to build a jacket around it, tucking it in. And you'll notice on the picture on the right, there's a stake in there that we included. And this is all just to give it some good stability. Now from this point on, depending on the weather and the humidity, we're talking anywhere from 30 minutes to a couple of hours before this sets up well. And once we get that point where the jacket is nice and hard, we can now roll it over and that surface that was down in the ground will now be pointed up at the end. And two guys celebrating, oh, a job well done, yes. <laughs> Here's another angle and we're beginning to think through as that sets up and dries as to what's gonna be next for us to begin to work our way through the skeleton itself. Now here we're gonna look at the hips, the sacrum, the ischium, uh, the pubis bone. The hips are quite big on dinosaurs, quite elaborate, and they can tell us a lot about uh, how we see, and might even, that's the, one of the initial ways in which we categorize dinosaurs. This is me starting here on just wrapping the sacrum which is a large complex of vertebra and hip pieces. And as we go through, we're looking to 
again, stabilize things. It's a little broader, a little wider, so I have to be sure that I've tunneled well underneath it here. Now here, we get to the point where we're gonna flip this. This is always a moment of trepidation because even though I've wrapped it underneath, what I don't want to do is I don't want to lift it and flip it and have bones fall out the bottom. If you're sitting there wondering, have I ever had that happen to me? Yes. And it wasn't a good day. Um, I won't digress into that, but that's, that is a thing that we're trying to be cautious of as we go through. So let's see what these guys do here. Now you can see it remained more vertical longer than I really wanted it to because I wanted to be cautious of that, but we got it flipped over. Now we're talking about jackets, they're probably a minimum 150 pounds, and some of the bigger ones were probably three to 350 pounds. So it's, there, there's a lot of just manpower. I like to have young men with me helping out. That's always a good thing. Uh, there's Martha and I celebrating a moment where we get to work together. We usually are working with others, and so we got to, that's my wife there on the left. And so we enjoy getting to work on projects like this. This is uh, another flange of the ilium, the iliac crest here that we're working on, flipping that over. And it's always good to get one out in good shape and you have a moment where you can just enjoy reflecting on that. Here are the guys are working on what's called the pubis bones. You see the picture that's inset more in the upper left hand corner. And they, in life, parallel one another. And oddly enough, they were right there in that same position in the ground. And so that was nice to kind of, we pulled them out together. And you can see the process of, again, just working through, digging down, creating a jacket around it, and then beginning to flip it and take it out of the ground. The tail was really one of the more fascinating parts for me visually. It was interesting to see bones, what we call articulated. Articulation means in orders. And so we see the tail section laid out. Uh, the Montessor tail roughly has about 50 vertebra. We had uh, close to 30 that were there in the ground. This particular section is about 17 in a row. And as we work through that, you get a sense here of the centrum here. These are the centrum, these are the chevrons, and the spinous processes are up just above the picture right here. And so we're gonna take this out as one section. We're beginning to work through the preparation of the ground and begin to start working on getting it exposed. As we think ahead, we're recognizing that what we need is to be able, when we flip it over, is we want to be able to manage it well. And so we start creating these wood frames underneath. So when it rolls completely over, we've got a frame that will support it and the frame that's actually integrated into the plaster jacket itself. And so we take extra pains to do that, particularly with this one right here. Here's Jason kind of uh, getting a set for the motion we're gonna take. And here's us flipping this guy over. This one's probably 300, 350 pounds. And it rolled over really well. And from here, we can load it up in the truck and take it back to the museum just fine. Now, as we move in, I wish we had more of the skull. Uh, the there was very little of the skull itself. Uh, this is the skull cap. I've got the picture there on the bottom left to kind of give you a sense of what it would have looked like. Uh, we have the two uh, superorbital fenestras, what they're called, the holes openings, they're common to dinosaurs, and they're sitting at the top of the skull. And here is the right uh, jaw, lower jaw, the mandible. Here's Martha working on the neck. The neck is always curved on a Montessor, that's a natural life position, you'll see that picture in the upper right hand corner. And you see all the vertebra sectioned together and how they lay on top of one another. There's a close up. Then as we move to the ribs and the legs here, we're getting down to the end. This was actually a very broad jacket. It had a good bit of weight to it. 
And so as we open up and are again tunneling under the ground to get this thing out, there is also, this is the humerus that's attached. It's actually in life position. There would have been some vertebra up in here. And we're again thinking ahead, what do we need to do to not just wrap it from the top, but begin to support it as we get underneath it. This particular frame that we built, we call the dollhouse. There's no special technique other than that's just what it looked like when we were done, but it gave us a good means by which to, to support it on the backside. I don't know the sound goes, comes through very well, but there's lots of grunts and groans as we go through this process. And then from here, we could load this guy up and get him into the truck and get him back to the museum. And sometimes you find little treasures, and what I mean is not you find bones you didn't know existed. So you flip these things over, and all of a sudden, there's bones that you didn't see uh, that you were fortunate enough to dig below enough and not damage in the process. And so that's always a fun part of what we do. Here are the legs. This is the other set of legs. We took them out. What you're seeing here is two femurs, a tibia, and a fibula that's all together. That's, that's that upper left-hand corner. And rather than flip this one, we decided to create a frame underneath it so that we might just carry it straight out like that. That was a big groan right there, if you couldn't tell. And again, working our way out, loading this thing up. Now, <clears throat> what is interesting is just reflecting upon the process that we do. Because in many respects, I have people from time to time say, have you ever tried this? Have you tried a winch? Have you tried bringing this out? And really, the techniques are really quite simple and really quite effective uh, beyond just manpower, but just how you frame it, how you prep it, how you break it down. Uh, because like I said, we're doing things that have been done for well over 100 years, and so much of it's just manpower. When we get them back to the lab here, we begin to get things unloaded and start to get, uh, this is the tail section we had to create, as you can see, uh, some straps and some boards to help just kind of be able to get us ar around it because it wasn't the kind of thing that we could l just get into the side and just carry it out. And once we get it into the lab, we begin to start cleaning the bones themselves. We're looking to begin to expose the surface. We're getting the matrix, what's called the matrix, dirt and rock that are off the surface. We're beginning to glue cracks where we see uh, loose pieces of bone on the surface. Uh, we're beginning to get glued down into the bone itself. And this is really a preliminary work. The goal is to get them so solidified is that when we get to that point, we can actually get the bones completely out of the jacket. Our goal is to build and erect some ironwork to actually stand the bones back up and put them back into life position one day. So hopefully in the next few years, we'll begin to get into that process. This is the ilium. This is the guys opening up. And when we begin to remove the plaster at the lab, uh, we've got cast saws, tin snips, things of that nature, just to begin to work the way, our way back through the material, uh, the field jacket itself, so that we can see what's going on and begin to clean the matrix off, as I mentioned before. Now, Dr. Thomas, had asked for a couple of pieces, uh, down, cord drills down into the bone itself and the hips, and so we were glad to help do that. It was the first time I've actually taken a drill and put a bit on it and drilled into the bone on purpose. I've probably done it many times accidentally, but on purpose, and so it was an interesting process to think about because what he's looking for is collagen down in the bones. And if you remember what we're thinking about from the larger context is, what are the bones actually telling us about, can we get a sense of how old they are? Because when you begin to think about the arguments of dinosaurs died out 65 plus million years ago, you begin to recognize that those processes being acted upon dinosaur bones for that long 
should utterly, in many respects, destroy almost everything that's there, but these, these types of materials should not be preserved within the bones themselves. In fact, we are seeing that as being the, the case. Uh, Dr. Mary Schweitzer really kind of kicked this off over 20 years ago uh, inadvertently by finding stretchy blood vessels and red blood cells. What this does is this really validates the historic account of Scripture of a young earth. And it's not just that we're standing upon the biblical authority of such positions, but we're also standing upon what science really is showing us about these fascinating creatures themselves. Here are the vials that we sent off. Here's our team. And it's an opportunity that I am thankful for because it's not just fulfilling a childhood passion for me, but it's actually getting to enjoy doing scientific work and really getting to validate and enjoy scripture at the same time. And to that, I'm thankful for what the Lord has given opportunity for me to do, and I hope you're encouraged um, by the process. So thank you very much, that's all I have, so thank you. Thank you so much, Tommy. Yes, I got to ask, who after that presentation is ready to go dig up some dinosaur bones? Let me see those hands. Yes. Or more like me, does anybody see how much work it is and think, man, I'm really grateful for guys like Tommy and Martha that they get to go dig those bones. Anybody? Just okay, some of us. Good. One more time, uh, Tommy, thank you so much for that presentation. Yes, if you want to, to learn more about that process of these, the, the, the preservation of these fossils, what that casting looks like, uh, Tommy and his bride, Martha, they have a workshop here in about 20 minutes. It's a limited space workshop. I did... Uh, confirm with the front service desk, we do have some more bracelets. You have to have a bracelet to get into that workshop, but it's a real hands-on experience. I want to get a little bit dirty. And in some of these specimens, I saw them unloading. Pretty impressive. Very, very large. So right after we dismiss here, run to the run to the customer service desk for your bracelets. Before before we leave, like he's excited. He's like, I gotta get a bracelet. It's gonna be so good. He said we might get dirty. Um, so yes, so that's an 11.30 workshop this morning. We have a 2 p.m. workshop with our children's educational specialist, Emily Steele. That's gonna be a lot of fun. Again, we asked if you wanna join that workshop, please go to customer service desk, let them know, and they will give you your uh, hand, uh, wristband. Um, go visit our booths in the atrium. We have some amazing exhibitors, some universities. We believe that the next generation of ICR scientists are in this room, and we want you to be on the, the, road, the road to success. So please, uh, we have amazing homeschool curriculums. We're at Cornerstone out there, fantastic curriculum. Um, some universities here locally. Um, if, I, I get it. We got some younger guests here, but if there's questions for the future. Go, go talk to them. Go hang out with them. I have in my hand a Acts and Facts magazine. Every two months, ICR sends out this free subscription. It's, it's the latest information on research that, that we're finding out. It, it's, it's information about our latest exhibitions that we go on. Everything that ICR is doing, you're going to find out about it in this every other month edition of this Acts and Facts magazine. We don't want you to go home without taking one of these with you. And furthermore, we put a, 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 in the back of the room, you can see that table. We took all the excuses away. We want you to sign up for this free subscription. This, this really is a blessing for your home, a blessing for your family. If you have some loved ones that you know that you want to just have the latest faith building research in their home, sign them up. Wouldn't that be cool? Sign them up. Go to our exhibit hall. We have dinosaurs everywhere. It's going to be so much fun. Um, and don't forget, we want to see you back in here at 1 p.m. to hear from our paleo biochemist, Dr. Brian Thomas. More dinosaur stuff. Thank you guys for being here. Enjoy. You are dismissed.
Have you ever been told that the Bible isn't true? Perhaps someone claimed the text is corrupted, or that it's just a bunch of stories designed to convey universal truths, or that it's no longer relevant today. You know that you should speak up and debunk these claims, but you're not sure what to say. If so, you're not alone. That's why we want to invite you to the Get Bold Conference at the ICR Discovery Center the weekend of April 26th. The 20「Yes」。Welcome to the 1 p.m. session. We're going to get to hear uh, from our paleo biochemist, Dr. Brian Thomas. Very exciting. ICR's very own dinosaur expert. But first, if you know a high school or college age student that you want to be involved with Get Bold, it's a fantastic two day event. Um, we, we get to hear speakers, we get to hear ICR's own Dr. Frank Sherwin, uh, Carl Kirby, and Dr. Juan Valdez of Reasons for Hope, and Bill Jack of Worldview Academy. This conference includes training in apologetics, evangelism, and even some excursions. We go offside and we practice in a fun way some of these applications. I think I saw on the itinerary there's even some entertainment planned. I think there's Uh, a world-class juggler, okay? So that's going to be fun. That's going to be cool, we're, you know, because we got we to gotta get our brains warmed up, right? We, so much learning. We're putting so much new knowledge into it. We got we to gotta watch somebody juggle for a little bit, you know, just to uh, let our brains get loose and stretch for more information, right? So... <laughs> <laughs> you guys are ready. I want to thank you all for being here today. We have a two o'clock uh, uh, ex uh, exhibit um, that it's, it's, it's a hands-on exhibit by our educa uh, ch children's educational specialist, Emily Steele, um, and she, it's going to be a whole lot of fun. It is going to be a limited um, audience, so if you have already uh, registered for it, it's free. Um, you'll want to get a wristband from the customer service desk right up front. So now we're going to hear Dr. Brian Thomas's um, research titled Discovering Dinosaurs. Um, Dr. Brian Thomas is ICR's paleo biochemist. Would you please, and everyone watching online, please help me welcome Dr. Brian Thomas. Thank you. Thank you. Well, these are the five dinosaur details I wish I knew back when I was a kid because I was not told these five. I was told a different five. And I remember the first time I heard them, I was like seven years old and we went into a dinosaur museum. 
and I was holding my mom's hand, and we were walking in the front doors, and my mom opened the front doors, and there's this guy, a big T-Rex head, and it was positioned right in front of my face, and I was scared. And I said, what is that? It's the first time I had ever seen anything like that, and I, it looked scary, and, and I thought, where did that come from? And then I, my next thought, even at seven, was, are they still alive? Or <laughs> I'm glad it's not in my backyard still alive, because that looks like it would eat me in one bite, you know. And where did those come from? How did those get here? How do we know that those lived, and what's the deal? And so my mom said, well, let's ask the museum lady. So we went and asked the museum lady, my son has a question for you. And go ahead and ask your question, Brian. What is that? <laughs> Basic question. That is a dinosaur fossil. And then the museum lady, who knows everything, because she's a volunteer at the museum. Uh, she said, um, by the way, our volunteers are the best. Um, she said, this is, a, this is a rock in the shape of a bone. That's what a fossil is. All the original bone is totally gone. All that's left is a rock that, take, that takes the shape that the original bone had. And it was deposited underground 67 million years ago, and I thought, Okay, those are the details I needed. Now I know where these things came from. And it wasn't until I got to college, years later, when a friend challenged me about what I believed and what I had been told over and over again, even in movies. That's really where I learned a lot. Learned <laughs> a lot about history was from silly movies. Well, anyway, and he said, have you read this creation book? And it turns out that the book was by our founder, Dr. Henry Morris. And I said, I'm not going to read your silly creation book. He challenged me to read it. I read the book. And by the time I finished that book, I thought, these are the details that I've never heard. And so for 50 years now, the Institute has been um, basically exploring and explaining these kinds of details that support scripture. So our mission is to encourage worship by glorifying Jesus as the creator, not nature. And it's to edify folks. That means to, uh, to encourage folks with, with uh, like what we're talking about today, dinosaur details that you don't hear out there. But if you did hear them, you might come to your own conclusion. And your conclusion might be that this, um, that this encourages us to believe God and take him at his word. And then finally, evangelism. With this new confidence that we have, being able to believe everything that's in the word, we have new confidence in sharing the good news about what Jesus has done. And that's what these dinosaur details did for me. And boy, I took that book back to my friend and I, with humility. And I said, I did not know this stuff. And because of this new information, I have to change the whole way I think. And I had to go back to my Bible and read it again with newfound respect. Well, the first piece of my Bible that I doubted at that time was the creation bit, you know, the Genesis chapter one parts. It says God created. And uh, I've had people say, you know, God didn't make the dinosaurs. They're just deceptions, you know, they're, or, or they don't exist or something like that. Uh, but they do, they do exist and I dug them. So can you dig it? Yes. The more I look at these, the more I see evidence of clever design, not the mishmash, haphazard results that, we, that would have come from natural processes, but actually very well put together uh, bones to make these creatures. Some of them were big, like this Diplodocus. We're going to say dinosaur names today, so everybody say Diplodocus. Okay, good. And so this is me standing there at the Denver Museum of Natural History with my camera, and I'm standing in one place and taking multiple shots, and then I jam up there like that because it's so big. I mean, it's 30, 90 feet long and 30 tons, some of these guys. And uh, how do you hold that much up? And then you've got this long neck and then the long tail. You know, whoever built this had to face the same engineering challenges that someone who made the first airplanes faced. And what do you have to do with an airplane? You have to make those wings. So you have to, you have to, you have to um, engineer the wing. Would you get into an airplane and fly in it if the wings were made of cinder blocks and bricks? 
I would not. And if you're shaking your head, no, you're, you're with me. Uh, so you have to have it lightweight and yet strong. And that's exactly the kind of engineering. And yet the thing was, this creature was really massive. And so you have to have um, thick and strong parts where it needed to be thick and strong to support all that weight. And that's what we have with the hips. And we have this arch shape with the hip, so all the, all the weight could balance. Actually, with Diplodocus, he could raise up on his front, he could raise up his front two legs. He puts his tail down um, and makes it like a tripod. And then he could, he could raise his neck even higher, uh, 100 feet high in the air, and, and eat tree leaves um, in, back when he lived. So, uh, but it can balance on this hip. And the hip reminds me of you know, the arches. And so whenever I look at these arches, what do I think? Wind, erosion, and then perfect arches. No, I think someone put these arches there on purpose. And I think the same thing about these arches in the dinosaur hip and about the lightweight structures of its vertebrae. Vertebrae. Uh, okay, kids, point to your vertebra. Show me one of your, yeah, point to your own. I like some of the adults doing it too. I, everyone's got a kid inside of them, so yeah, point. So you've got lower lumbar vertebrae, thoracic ones, those are hard to reach. Then you have your cervical vertebrae. Well, this guy had lots of neck or cervical vertebrae. And they have hollowed out spaces to save weight, raised ridges right where they needed to be raised in order to support where those connecting uh, ligaments and tendons would have been to hold that neck stable and out in place. And it reminds me of my bicycle construction and clever design in my bicycle, which has a chain ring with holes in it, tubes, not solid bars in, in places on this bicycle. What do the holes in the chain ring help us do? Save what? Save weight, make it lighter, yeah. So lots of clever design. And in fact, when I was at the um, Field Museum in Chicago, they had a sign and it said, sauropods were engineered for size. So they're recognizing the fact of engineering. But if I were to ask these secular, if I were to ask these secular scientists, well, okay, who, well, who was the engineer then? If you see engineering, doesn't that imply an engineer, an actual engineer? What would they say? Well, what I was taught was natural processes. And you know what? When we attribute to nature what only an actual person could have done, then we have gone and we have fulfilled the description that we find right there in Romans chapter 1, where we worship and serve the created rather than the creator as we suppress the truth in unrighteousness. We don't, as sinners, suppress the truth. We don't hold it down on purpose, which is what we do. We don't do that because there's not enough evidence. No, no, we see the evidence. Sauropods were engineered, no doubt about it. Uh, but we suppress it because of unrighteousness. It's because... Men loved darkness rather than light because our deeds are evil and we want to pretend like our evil deeds are really actually okay. And God is trying to say, no, they're not. <laughs> we have a sin problem and I came to fix it. And so that's part of what this clever design points us toward is Genesis creation was correct all along. So here I am holding a, a um, hadrosaur egg. This hadrosaur is now on display right there. And uh, you could see that. But I mean, imagine designing something, but then designing a machine like a you know, cell phone that can copy itself so that when your kid comes up and says, I want a cell phone. Well, hang on. Mommy and daddy are going to put their cell phones in a drawer and then wait a few minutes and out comes a little cute little baby cell phone. Would that be great? And then it, grow and it takes in you know, uh, carbon and silicon dioxide and it, makes, it, makes, it grows itself. It copies itself, makes generation. I mean, we can't design anything like this at all yet. It would just be so complicated. It's a whole uh, additional degree of, of cleverness that this great designer, and it matches. Uh, it matches what we expect to see if the Bible's right about Jesus being that designer. All things were made by him, and, and nothing was made without him. John 1.1. 1, 1. Similar to uh, Genesis 1.25. And God made, not nature made, not the devil made, God made. He gets the credit. The beast of the earth. I think dinosaurs qualify as beasts of the earth. So I wish I knew that dinosaur detail, that these creatures looked like they were fitted on purpose. Fitted every piece, crafted, handcrafted to fit with the next bone uh, 
um, on purpose so that it could live and function the way it did. And it doesn't look like mistakes were made there. So the next dinosaur detail uh, that I wish I knew when I was a kid was, man, these creatures died in a catastrophe. Catastrophe. So it's catastrophic death, not slow and gradual and normal. Well, this um, is a, say it after me, Camarasaurus. And it's on display at the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh. If you're there, they say it, Carnegie. So I guess we have to say Carnegie. Um, and so some researchers, and it's, it's beautiful. I mean, it's very rare to find a sauropod with the head still near it, let alone right next to it. Um, and then to find most of the carcass still in one place is just spectacular. So that's why they left it in that position and put it on display here. Uh, but it's great. So I took uh, my own pictures, but this image was um, part of the article, the, that, um, the technical research article that some researchers um, published some years ago now, and they were asking themselves the question about this pretty famous fossil on display there. What about the position of its head? Do you see how its chin is like sort of down? And so they were asking like, is this normally how he could put his head or is there some... So they analyzed the vertebrae and the, the, the neck, the right beneath the head, and this was their conclusion. I thought it was so funny and so obvious. And there's my picture of it, just so you could see the head there real close up. They said, the post-mortem dorsiflexion disarticulated the zygopophyses such that it was preserved in a pose that was unlikely attainable in life. And I thought, Psh, everybody knows that. And then, um, and then I got out a dictionary and looked up all the words, and I found that it meant his neck was broken. Broke neck, okay? So broken neck, is that slow, gradual, everyday process, or... I think it fits the catastrophic category. In fact, how do you even get a creature that big buried in mud so that it would even turn into a fossil? It does not happen today. Cows aren't turning into fossils. Um, even small birds aren't turning into fossils. Fish, fish aren't even turning into fossils uh, in lakes or oceans. These creatures, when they die, they just get scavenged and they decay or they degrade, either one. Well, the National Geographic family book on dinosaurs, get, get our book instead. It's called Guide to Dinosaurs, and it was fun to help write. We don't have this kind of storytelling. Look, listen to this storytelling. Is this, like, scientific? Compsognathus, say that. Uh, that was pretty mediocre. Wake up. Compsognathus lived close to the shore of a calm lake. How do they know that? Were they there? Is that how they know? Just because we have a white lab coat? Does that mean scientists know everything about the past? This is storytelling about the past. Um, what we do know is we have a dead dinosaur. That's what we know. So we don't know where it lived. Maybe it lived somewhere else and it died over here. In fact, that's pretty likely considering it's, it was deposited in flowing water that was carrying the mud. Anyway, close to the, uh, the shore of a calm lake. So... Do calm lakes exist today? Do we have calm lakes? Yes, we do. Are fossils forming in the bottom of calm lakes today? It's just mud, guys. There's worms down there, clams, and whatever might fall down there, it just rots and it gets scavenged and eaten. No fossils forming. So if they don't form in calm lakes today, why in the world would we say that they formed in calm lakes way back in the unknown uh, history? I don't think it was a calm lake. I think, that's a, um, I think that's a silly story. Well, here are some compsognathid uh, fossils, the one on the left, compsognathus, and then the one on the right, anatomically identical, but different continent. So because it was found in, I guess, China, they called it Sinosauropteryx. Say that one. Well, it's better. Good. So yeah, the, the calm lake, uh, the calm waters, took its head and calmly smashed it against its pelvis, that's what happened there. Must be. So this neck arched back, it's like, uh, it's really common for any cr creature, fossil, that's got a long neck. Whether it's a bird, which there are birds buried right alongside the dinosaurs, and along with uh, shark, te shark teeth and turtles and clams. So we have swamp creatures and ocean creatures and sky creatures mixed together. But I think that fits the flood. I'm thinking in terms of Noah's flood. So the, the clever design points to creation just as much as the catastrophic death points to the flood. Or so you've got to have a lot of water moving a lot of creatures and burying them. 
catastrophically. Well, this is at the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman. And I went there and I saw the dinosaur with its neck arched back with this like choking posture. And then the placard says an agonizing death. And I thought, yes, you finally got it right. It's a correct placard, one that I can say, this is on the right track. And then I started reading the details. And I could show you the picture, and you can <laughs> or get a magnifying glass, and you can get the. But it's, this is what it says. This dinosaur was probably choking. And I said, yes, it was probably choking. Because a predatory dinosaur was clamped on its neck. And I'm looking, and there's no predatory dinosaur anywhere. So why would it be choking if there's no, why would it be a predatory, anyways, I think it may be choking on the mud. Maybe it's surrounded by mud and that's what it's choking. But if we say, ah, it was choking on the mud that surrounded it, then you know what that would sound like? It would sound like a muddy, watery catastrophe of biblical proportions. And uh, it, it's because we have so many creatures with their necks arched back um, on all the continents, dinosaurs on every continent, including Antarctica, buried in rock layers, and these rock layers are extensive. If you want to go with us on our dig this fall to um, Glendive Dinosaur and Fossil Museum, there it's, you, I mean, the last time I went, I drove for an entire 10-hour day on the same rock layer that covers the entire state of Wyoming. And then you jump states to, um, to um, Montana, and it changes names, but it's the same rock layer. Goes from Lance to Hell Creek Formation, same rock layer. So we're talking hundreds of thousands of square miles, all deposited at the same time. One giant mud flow that carried all these creatures and, and, um, and buried them all at the same time. Agonizing death, lots of water, lots of mud. That's what I would expect from Noah's flood. I think these are flood fossils. And here we have this T-Rex on display at, um, um, this is um, the Field Museum in Chicago, back when Sue, the most famous fossil in the world, is probably this one, Sue, nicknamed after the discoverer, Miss Sue Hendrickson. Well, the one on the left is Sue's skull. I took this picture, and it shows like all the bones have been repositioned into life position. So notice the difference because there's the Sioux on the left that's, that's a replica, really well done, and then there's the actual Sioux's head in a, in a glass case so we can get right up next to it and worship. I, I mean, uh, inspect it, look real close at it. And we notice some differences. Do you see the crushed in nose, the bent nose? Some of you see it? Well, the two people there are looking at a sign that's explaining this difference, and it's explaining why Sue has a crushed nose. And they're looking at this sign with straight faces, and I don't understand how they could do that, because here's what the sign said. Crushed nose. When Sue was found, her pelvis was on top of her snout. So pelvis, bam, top of the snout. Um, so this creature, six tons and a half, 40 feet long plus, and it was bent like a pretzel, okay? Uh, this may sound odd. I, yeah, I think it does. Discovering a theropod dinosaur in this death pose is surprisingly common. Well, that means it's odd there, and it's odd there. It's odd wherever. So that means it's really odd um, because it doesn't happen today at all, like this, anywhere. This pose may be caused by muscle spasms. You know, muscle spasms. Because every time I get muscle spasms, my pelvis just smashes my nose <laughs> breaks my nose, and then I have to go to the chiropractor. It's a real deal. And I'm, I'm reading this sign, and I'm literally laughing out loud. And those two people, we had traded places, you know, and they're looking at the other side. And they just started backing away from me. I don't know why. These people, they're backing away. Well, there I am, you know, looking at these different T-Rex um, specimens on display. There's Stan in South, um, South Dakota, Black Hills. And I mean, these creatures could not move fast enough to get away. Otherwise, they would have gotten away. They couldn't swim fast enough. They couldn't walk, run fast enough. Uh, and, and, and after they got swallowed by this wave, think of a tsunami times 10 of moving uh, mud. They got, they got uh, hammered under this mud. They couldn't bulldoze their way out of that. They weren't strong enough. So the mud was faster and stronger than even these enormous ancient creatures. Now Noah's flood gives us a context to understand uh, that, how that could have happened, because the Bible said, and I should have been believing this all along, and the waters prevailed exceedingly 
on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. Does this say that the Himalayas and the Rockies were covered? No. These are the high hills of the pre-flood world. Well, those were covered. The Himalayas and the Rockies formed because of the flood, during the flood year. By the way, how long was the flood? About a year. About a year. People say 40 days, 40 nights. That's just the beginning, guys. That was just when the rain finally, uh, the, the rain fell and fell. Hey, let's do Q&A after. Thanks. And now, third dinosaur detail, which I wish I knew. So if dinosaurs were like alive, you know, during creation week, and they lived for the 1,656 years of the pre-flood world, most of them died out because they didn't get on the ark. Two of each kind got on the ark. That means they're still alive, like after the flood. What happened to the dinosaurs after the flood? And so would I look in fossils for evidence of dinosaurs alive after the flood? Uh, I would say, generally speaking, no, because the vast majority of fossils were deposited in the flood. So the flood had happened. It's passed. So now, so now I would look at human artifacts. And it turns out that a lot of our cultures, all of our cultures, have legends of dragon encounters. And uh, there's different words that we no longer use, but our ancestors used for these dragons. Um, but there's a few artifacts, and of course, if you go to the Dragon Encounters wall here at the Discovery Center, you'll see even better and more than what I'm going to show you. Just tip of the iceberg here um, of human artifacts that seem to suggest, you could be the judge, I'll just show you what our ancestors left behind, seem to suggest that they knew about creatures that no longer exist today, but that did exist after the flood. So this is an Uruk cylinder seal on display at the Louvre in Paris. And there it shows these creatures with long necks that are intertwined and long legs, long tails, look sort of sauropod-like, and then birds, of course. And they would take this and roll it out on a piece of clay, bake the clay, now the clay is decorated. And now, a um, thousand miles away, thousands of years later, in Carlisle Cathedral in the north of England, same setup. Legs that go down, long tail, long necks intertwined. Um, it's like these two separate artists were looking at the same behavior of similar looking creatures when they did these pieces of art. So we were there and my wife was used her feminine wiles to ask the rector, could you please move the rug so we could see Bishop Bell's tomb? And so he did and he said, there are no dinosaurs in this artwork. So we said, yes sir, and we took our pictures. <laughs> Um, but these look like sauropods, and, and if you look to the left and right of this decoration, you'll see, um, you know, pheasants and eels and regular animals that are still alive and have not yet gone extinct. But this one on the left, he shows tail spikes. At the end of the tail of this sauropod look-alike, four tail spikes. And uh, it turns out that Shunosaurus was discovered in the 1990s. Uh, as a dinosaur, which was a sauropod, that's the four legs on the ground, long tail, long neck, that's a sauropod, with four tail spikes. So maybe the artist here from the 1400s got into a time machine, went forward in time, learned about the paleontology, and then went backwards in time and did his artworks so that he would make exact lookalikes, um, give the spit an image of what was only to be discovered in the future. Or maybe there's a different explanation, but you come up with your own. So this is the Narmer palette, and again we have these long necks intertwined, and this is the pharaoh making, a, uh, making his name great, saying, I captured the biggest, baddest beast in all the land. And the Egyptian word for uh, sauropod was pimwa, which is the cognate word that we have in the Bible, for Hebrew, uh, behemoth. Same word. And th this is a Chateau du Blois, and it used to be, in the Blois Valley used to be swamps until they drained them in the 1700s. But when this was made, in, in, or before then, uh, the, it was swampy. So they had swamp creatures, including these, um, well, I don't know what this dragon-looking thing is, the main one. Uh, it doesn't match anything I know from fossils. And in fact, most artwork from our ancestors that shows like a dragon, it's fanciful. It's not, doesn't match anything we know from fossils. But the little baby on the right, that is exactly what we would expect if a Mayasaura were actually alive recently, relatively recently, hundreds of years ago, perhaps in um, Europe, something like that. Um, this is also Europe, Italy, and um, this was actually, I think it's 100 BC. This was made, this little picture of the Nile. 
the creatures and animals and happenings on the Nile River Delta way back then. And uh, so there's lots of interesting things going on here in the Nile mosaic of Palestrina. But the one, this one is really curious to me. The natives are restless and they're th maybe they feel threatened by this creature with two big tusks. Now it does not match anything we know from fossils, but it does match an entirely different whole group maybe a whole class of animals that are all also extinct, like dinosaurs are extinct. And they're the mammal-like reptiles. Mammal-like reptiles, they went extinct too, since they were deposited in rock layers from the flood, at least. And the Greek lettering gives their name for its, its uh, uh, I don't know Greek very well, but it's, it's got crocodile and leopard in there, lepardalis, uh, or croc crocodilia, something like that. So anyway, it's, it's mammal-like and it's reptile-like to them and also to us. And we know from fossils that uh, there was a gorgonopsid creature uh, that had these big tusks, and uh, maybe that's what this was. Well, uh, s those who say you can't be looking at a, you know, a look-alike of a gorgonopsid because those went extinct in, um, those went extinct, um, you know, 80 million years ago, which is tens of millions of years before humans ever existed. Um, it, it, so I'm saying, we, why discount the evidence based on a belief system? Why not let the evidence form our belief system? And they say, well, it's got to be a crocodile, because we know it can't be a Gorgonopsis, so it must be a crocodile, except that they actually have crocodiles on the same piece of art, and they look like crocodiles, and there's a hippo, and it's a good artist, so he did a good... Uh, he did good work. So there's a, just a few more. Here's Ta Prome in Cambodia, a little temple ta uh, a column. And what do we have? We have um, this, this uh, animal with big plates on its back. And maybe the artist knew this one also firsthand. We don't know, but maybe he did. And then here's a really interesting one. It's, um, it's from Barcelona, and it's Middle Ages again. And here's a knight, and he's Rescuing the damsel from, this is probably a depiction of St. George and the dragon, so venerated all across Europe. And, but it turns out that the dragon that the artist chose to represent St. George's dragon was like different in every, in every country and at different times. Well, this artist used this dragon or this figure or form to represent that dragon. And it turns out that it is the spitting image of what we know as Nothosaurus, if you want to say that. Nothosaurus. It's got that distinctive uh, flat head and uh, teeth that go outside the jaw. Wow, Nothosaurus. Known from fossils in rock layers that are, tr that are Triassic, so these are below most of the dinosaurs. Now, what are we saying with flood geology? Not just the layers that contain dinosaurs, but the layers below those and layers below those. And the whole rock stack was deposited in just that one year um, after tsunami, after tsunami comes crashing in, depositing the sea creatures in the lowest layers, not because they evolved first, but because they were already down there when the flood started. So they were buried first. And then as the floodwaters progressed up that continent, that pre-flood world had probably one major continent, then they would get the, the shallow marine creatures next. So we see lots of shallow marine fossils. And then wetlands, and, and that's dinosaurs, and then finally, the last and uppermost layers to deposit would have been the, the uh, lions, tigers, bears, cats and dogs, and creatures that live on high, dry ground. They would be in the uppermost layers, and that's really what we see in the fossil record. But these clashes with dragons um, match a particular passage in the Bible, and it's Job chapter 40, which describes this behemoth and look now at the behemoth which I made along with you. So we ask ourselves, well, what is this creature that God is directing Job to look at? And he's got his strength in his hips. Okay, we talked about the Diplodocus hips, and he could balance on those hips. And he moves his tail like a cedar. And then my Bible study note says, or translation note says, possibly a hippopotamus. So I went to the Dallas Zoo, and I looked at the hippo tail, and I thought to myself, there's nothing that reminds me of a tree in this. It's like a little flap thing. And then finally the hippo like came up out of the water and used this tail as a, as a mm, uh, fertilizer distribution device, complete with sound effects that I wish I could unsee and unhear. Whew. And I thought to myself, that doesn't look like a tree, and it doesn't remind me of any kind of a tree in any way. I don't think it was a hippo. 
But the chief of the ways of God, this the passage says, and I think that references the biggest land creature that God ever made. And we know from fossils that that would have been, and from maybe some of these human artifacts, that that would have been the sauropod dinosaurs. Okay, the fourth. Are we getting smarter or dumber? Smarter? Some of us? Yeah, dumber. Depends on what you, depends on what you think. The fourth dinosaur detail. I just wish I knew these details so that I could have made my own choice about where I came from. Is the Bible right? Because I knew I couldn't trust the Jesus parts of the Bible if I couldn't trust the Genesis parts of it. If the Genesis parts of the Bible are wrong, then there's no Adam, there's no sin, there's no original sin, and then there's no need for a Savior. Like, what's that all about? It erases the need for a Savior. So I, need, I needed to know the truth. And as I'm, as I'm sort of... Uh, asking myself these questions, I'm looking at the fossils in a different way, and I'm actually considering what, what I thought were these crazy creation scientists, but after a while I thought, they, they're onto something, and now I represent, I, I am one. So that's, uh, that's the, the turn that my life took, and collagen decay had a role in that. And then I got a PhD in this, this is my specialty. So collagen is a protein. And uh, so who's heard of it? Take collagen supplements. Yeah, good. So it's part of your bones. It's part of your skin. And it's a, it's a, it's a tough, ropey protein. Um, and the deal with collagen is uh, it does not last longer uh, than a million years at most. And that's under ideal conditions, which exist only in a lab. So a million years is the max shelf life based on repeatable lab bench decay rate studies that have been published in the technical literature. And so with a million years at 10 degrees Celsius, average annual temperature, man, that's a short shelf life when we compare that with the age assignments given to fossils like this one. And there's the skull that um, attended to the femur that was part of this, that the femur uh, that was um, broken open and then researchers dissolved the mineral part of the bone away and published their results here in the journal Science in 2005. And look at those connective tissues, branching blood vessels, and they found evidence of hemoglobin protein also making the, some of these tissues, uh, tissue fragments or tissue remnants, making them still colored red. I mean, come on guys, this is good enough to fit in a hot dog. Yeah, this is almost food grade, these uh, tissues inside these bones. So yeah, I was there at the Museum of the Rockies and I saw this and I was like, this is the one where they published all the soft tissue. Amazing, look, it's the one with the soft tissue in the blood vessels. And again, people started walking away from me. I don't understand these folks. Well, the scientific community really gave these study authors a tough backlash and they said, that cannot be from T-Rex because we know that tissues can't last one million years, but we also know that the T-Rex is 70 million years old under the ground, and so you, it, you must have dropped your hot dog in the test tube or something. And um, so they said, well, let's find a different dinosaur. So they got a different dinosaur from a different country and used a different laboratory to process it, and they found the same kinds of things in their Edmontosaurus type, their duckbill type dinosaur, bl branching blood vessels, bone cells called osteocytes, Really stunning results. Um, and there's just a lot more. I've collected now 121 different uh, technical journal articles that, con that compile um, example after example of uh, original biochemistry in these fossils. And here's one. This is from Kansas. So everybody say Mosasaur if you want. Mosasaur. Mosasaur. It's a swimming, it's an extinct marine reptile. Uh, and so he would have had a, a big tail, of, like a shark tail. And, um, but this marine reptile has a big red patch in its rib cage. I don't know if you could zoom in with your eyeballs and see that red. And so the study authors were noticing, and they described in their journal article published in 2010, the journal PLOS One, and they said, uh, it's got skin scales from this reptile stuck down onto the bone. Wow, and it's covering the whole carcass. So we have all the different skin scales, and it even had purple still in the retina of its eyeballs. And then it got to this red patch. They said, what makes it red? And they found evidence of hemoglobin decay fragments. So old, old hemoglobin is what's still there, making it red. So when I saw this, I didn't know it was gonna be there, but I'm, but I'm at the Los Angeles County Museum, 
of natural history. And boy, I, it was on display. And there's this big glass case. And I said, guys, guys, this is the one. This is the Mosasaur with the blood. And they said, the study author said, it's probably the remnants of its what they called visceral organs. And the red patch here is right where a dolphin's heart is positioned in its streamlined body. So they suggested that it was the heart remnants. And so I, I got so excited, I said, take a picture, take a picture. I want a picture of me pointing to the, the remnant of its heart, uh, still, still colored red uh, there in this fossil taken from Kansas, from the Niobrara chalks. By the way, the Niobrara formation goes from where to where? It's in Kansas, but it goes from Canada to Mexico. All deposited, this one chalk formation all at once, covering the western and central um, North America. Wow. And so this creature was buried catastrophically, and it looks like recently, buried recently. Uh, here's some more. And this is from New Jersey, just published way back in 2022, and they found blood vessels um, from a modern croc and a fossilized crocodile-like creature, um, Thoracosaurus there. And we have done our own research. So here, if you were here earlier this morning, you might have seen... Um, uh, Mr. Tommy Lohman present on uh, Ruth, and so they sent some bit of that fossil, and I was able to use a special microscope technique that we have access to, to image the bones. We take the bone, and we polish it really, really thin, thin enough so that light can go through it, so we can take pictures of it. And then we have a special microscope that, that does polarized light. And so um, I'm going to try that one more time, because it's supposed to be a video. And it worked when we practiced it. Oh, hey. So whenever you see the bone tissue, which is, um, which is all this, this business, when you see it change from blue to gold or gold to blue, all this is bone, that is an indication that something is in the bone that's changing the, uh, the light and twisting the light and changing the light's color. And in fresh bone, that something is always collagen. So this bone looks like it has plenty of collagen left in it. It also has lots of cracks. You see these, this like a crack here. And, and this is an opening where you've got mineral has precipitated inside the pore spaces of the bone. That's called permineralization. So we know it's an old bone. We know it's fossil bone, but we know it's also still looking pretty fresh with all that collagen to bend all that light. Wow. Uh, what spectacular results we have looking uh, look at these fresh fossils. Well, um, Jesus really revealed what he believed about beginnings. And who am I to tell Jesus he was wrong? I mean, he's kind of like God. He kind of like knows it all. And so I started to believe what Jesus believed. And he said, but from the beginning of creation, God, quote, made them male and female. And quote, the two shall be one flesh. He's quoting in the first place from Genesis chapter 1. And in the second place from Genesis chapter 2 as though these two chapters are actual, just straightforward history. That's what Jesus taught. And nor did he say, but, uh, but billions of years after the Big Bang beginning, God made them male and female. No, he said, right at the beginning of creation, creation week, day six, male and female, and dinosaurs, land creatures. And uh, uh, so I don't, I don't believe the Big Bang anymore. I used to, because it was all I ever, ever heard. Um, and, uh, and now I just go with what the scripture says, because eyewitness testimony trumps circumstantial evidence in a court of law. Well, the last dinosaur detail that I wish I knew when I was young and I would not have wasted so many years believing that I came from apes, which came from fish, and wasted those years living my life for myself. Now I know that life is really all about living for Jesus and uh, enjoying the forgiveness and the relationship that I have with him, knowing him, and what a blessing that is. Uh, and it, because when we know Jesus, we get to know him forever. That relationship lasts forever. Um, but it was carbon decay. And by carbon, I really mean radiocarbon. And the thing is, with radiocarbon, it does not last. Um, it, it doesn't even last 100,000 years. That's the maximum shelf life. Really, it's, ha it's close to half of that. But um, let's, just, let's just extend it out. The benefit of the doubt, and we'll say that carbon, radiocarbon can last, radiocarbon, you know, that's a radioactive version of the carbon atom, and it turns back into nitrogen um, after so long. It's about every 5,730 years, half of it will turn right back into uh, nitrogen. 
And so we just test these bones and other artifacts and see, hey, is there any radiocarbon in here? Because if there is, then it should not be uh, one million years old, let alone tens of millions of years, if that's the age assignment uh, from the conventional literature. And so we have a hadrosaur vertebra, and we sent some of that in, and it came back with radiocarbon. Yes, we, found, we have access to a triceratops horn, core, the brow horn. There's two brow horns and one nose horn, triceratops. We have the brow horn core, sent a piece of that in, and it came back with measurable amounts of radiocarbon still in the bone, as though it's thousands, not millions of years old. We found it even in this heavily mineralized, that's what makes it dark, colored bone from the Morrison Formation there in Colorado, and even from, um, what's this dinosaur called, anyone? Stegosaurus. Boy, Stegosaurus. Um, shouldn't have any radiocarbon in it if it's nearly as old as um, I was taught, but it does. Our sample did, and we thought maybe this is just North America. Maybe there's a problem with the bones we have on our continent. So we got this from China, a little sample, and if you want to say it, it's fun to say Sitacosaurus. Sitacosaurus actually starts with the letter P, so that's fun to look up. Found it in there. But this is consistent with the results that we got um, with the rate project that the Institute did um, back in the uh, 2000s. And in that project, we, um, we actually tested coal with age assignments of over 200 million years. And the coal is carbon. So if there's any radiocarbon in this solid carbon, then it would have to be younger than the age assignment. And sure enough, it was. We have measurable amounts of radiocarbon in the coal. And we even tested diamonds. We were the first group of scientists to even think outside the box like that. And we said, hey, if these diamonds, um, which how do you contaminate the, ca the carbon inside the diamond structure? And we tested diamonds, and it came back with measurable amounts of radiocarbon above background levels. And um, so you could see that other secular researchers followed on and tested their diamonds, and they found the same thing. Of course, they attributed their discovery of, or their verification of radiocarbon in diamonds to contamination. And here's the reason they used. Not because of any result or any um, experimental data point, but, but they said this, these diamonds are three billion years old. But we found radiocarbon in these diamonds and the radiocarbon can't last more than 100,000 years. Therefore, you see the logic? Therefore, the radiocarbon that we found in these diamonds had to be from contamination. All right, but that is just circular reasoning. You assume that the diamonds were 3 billion years old before you even ask the question about how old the diamonds are. So we're able, we're able and willing to ask the question, how old are these diamonds? And so uh, can these be younger than 3 billion or younger than 1 million? And you know, they have to be younger than 100,000, which means it fits this whole idea, which I used to think was crazy, of a, uh, of a, of a recently made world that's only 6,000 years old. The flood 4,400 or so years ago. And those diamonds popped up through these pipes from deep beneath the earth during the flood. So carbon decay, radiocarbon decay, is consistent with a recent creation. And this is where it led me. Uh, for if you believe Moses. Now, is Moses responsible for Genesis? Yeah, he's responsible for Genesis. If you believe Moses, said Jesus, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But you see, this is the culture we live in. If you do not believe in his writings, if you don't believe in Genesis creation, if you don't believe what he wrote about Genesis flood, how will you believe my words? So we have a whole culture that says, I don't have to believe the words of Jesus where he said, you're a sinner and you need me to save you because all of that stuff relies on the events that we know did not happen back in Genesis. And so we now have a culture of scoffers, scoff, scoff, scoff. And, um, but we're here to say at the Institute, there's no more reason to scoff. In fact, there's plenty of science to support what Scripture's been saying all along. We can trust our Bibles, and therefore we know we can trust the God who left us these words of truth that tells us where we came from, uh, why we're here, and even where we're going. So learn more about this with our resources, Guide to Dinosaurs, not the Nat Geo one, this one, the big Guide to Dinosaurs book there. And if you like this presentation uh, recorded in front of a live audience, uh, Dinosaurs and Man, DVD there. I wrote a little book called Dinosaurs and the Bible to cover some of these basics. Um, and I had a lady come up and say, I read your book and it changed the whole way I think. And you better bet I was glad about that. For the kids, uh, Dinosaurs 
God's mysterious creatures. And we've had, uh, uh, you know, parents and Sunday school teachers come up and say, I was reading this to my class, or I was reading this to my kids, and I had no idea about these details that confirm dinosaurs in uh, biblical history, in real world history. And so it's our subtle tactic to get parents to read stuff that they wouldn't otherwise read, is to make children's books. And then, of course, Creation Basics and Beyond is a nice book. If you're going to college or you know someone who's in college and they're going to have all kinds of questions, we answer over 50 questions, all of our scientists. What about the Ice Age? You know, what about carbon dating? Uh, what about this, that, and the other? Questions about origins. What about uh, how do I interpret Genesis 1? And so these are answered um, in the Creation Basics and Beyond. Thank you for your time today. Make sure you sign up for Acts and Facts, our free magazine, if you haven't done so already. And um, uh, I'll hang around in the atrium for Q&A. Thanks. Aren't you glad we have fun scientists at ICR? Dr. Thomas, you had me at the hippopotamus. I was just imagining God creating the hippopotamus saying, you know, they're going to call this guy behemoth, but behemoth has a tail like a tree. Watch this. <sighs> Fertilizer distributor. That was, that was good. Don't go watch that on YouTube. Way too funny. Thank you. Do we, do, can we give a big, big thank you again to Dr. Brian Thomas? Yes. And just like Dr. Dr. Thomas said, take home an Acts and Facts magazine. We have a table at the back of the room back here that you can sign up for a free, free subscription. These go out every two months. Our scientists, just like Dr. Brian, uh, they're working tirelessly, look, fighting off blindness, looking down microscopes all day, and then going into their offices to articulate and write their current research. And it's a huge blessing for your family and in your home when this, when this shows up with the latest acts and facts, the latest research. So take this home, sign up for a free subscription. And if you're watching online, thank you for watching online. We're going to be here all week through Saturday for, Di uh, for Dinosaur Week. Bring your friends. If you know somebody who should have been here with you today that, that needs to come later on this week, you be sure and tell them. Tell them we're going to be here. Thank you all so much for being here. God bless you and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Have you ever been told that the Bible isn't true? Perhaps someone claimed the text is corrupted or that it's just a bunch of stories designed to convey universal truths or that it's no longer relevant today. You know that you should speak up and debunk these claims, but you're not sure what to say. If so, you're not alone. That's why we want to invite you to the Get Bold Conference at the ICR Discovery Center the weekend of April 26, 2024. This joint effort between the Institute for Creation Research and Reasons for Hope is designed to equip and encourage you to defend your faith in an engaging way. This event is open to students from 8th grade to college, their parents, and youth ministry leaders. Come develop your apologetics repertoire and learn how science affirms scripture. Visit icrdiscoverycenter.org for more information. Go into